a mass wrestler walk out in Japanese promotion stardom, Goldberg's backstage heat with Triple H, and the latest candidate for who killed WCW. I'm Ollie Davis, and this is the Wrestle Talk News. Support Wrestle Talk. Have you ever looked at how many wrestlers in WWE use spears these days? Roman Reigns, Bobby Lashley, Charlotte Flair, Bron Breaker, Jey Uso, Angelo Dawkins. It's all obviously indicative of Triple H's secret nefarious plan to troll Bill Goldberg. According to Goldberg, maybe. In a recent appearance on the Nothing Left Unsaid podcast, Bill Goldberg claimed that WWE wrestlers didn't all start using spears until he returned there in 2016. And then it just so happened that every single wrestler uses the spear in their moves, right? Pretty ironic that happened when I got there, right? That's how they do it. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? It's like red! This isn't the first time Goldberg has spoken about spear spamming, as he also told Dr. Bo Hightower in 2022, now about 15 to 20 superstars in WWE use it. I used to hate that so many people use the move, but now I like it because you see them do it and then you see the master do it and there's a huge difference. He's kind of right. Back in 2016, when Goldberg made his return, it was only really Roman Reigns using the spear as his finisher, and WWE presumably limited who else could use that move elsewhere on the card because they wanted Roman to stand out. But then Bobby Lashley returned to WWE in 2018, whose finisher is the spear. And then Edge returned to WWE in 2020, whose finisher is also the spear. Charlotte Flair started using it. And before you knew it, the finisher had become a signature and then the signature became a strong grapple and pressing up. It's the life cycle of really cool wrestling moves. The super kick, the DDT, the freaking Canadian destroyer. Once super protected finishers that only one person did, but two decades later, they're a setup move for a near fall in the opening match. And it's not just a WWE thing. Wrestlers chuck spears up and down the cards in AEW, TNA, and beyond. Or again, it's Triple H's secret nefarious plot to troll Bill Goldberg, as Goldberg has also recently alleged. The fact that I didn't get along with Paul Levesque, Triple H, who is Vince's son-in-law, I think had everything to do with it when I got there. Because Goldberg here, he's not just talking about the proliferation of wrestlers using the spear, it's also because his WWE return coincided with Triple H booking someone else to beat Goldberg's undefeated streak. Someone by the name of Asuka. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I'm not having a go at Goldberg there. He seems to not even know who Asuka is, let alone how to say her name. So he's just pronouncing it phonetically, which shows how disengaged he was with the rest of the product when he was working there. But here's what he said. What, what's that, a girl what? Beat my, beat my undefeated streak. Oh, I didn't know that. What's the story there? Yeah, it's, I, I can't even remember. Asuka is her name, some Japanese girl. And they touted her as being the one to have the longest winning streak. And it just so happened that that culminated when I got there. Now, Asuka was signed by WWE on the 8th of September 2015 and won her first match a month later on the 7th of October. This started a 914 day long winning streak, which she was already almost halfway through when Paul Heyman first called out Goldberg on the 22nd of October 2016 episode of Raw. In fact, at that point, Asuka was only really 100 days out from beating Goldberg's 583 day undefeated streak. Asuka ended up winning almost 250 consecutive matches in almost three years, while Goldberg's was 161 matches in just under two. It's also important to note that Triple H seemed to have a long-running undefeated streak plan for Asuka long before conversations of bringing Goldberg back in even took place. It was reportedly only the summer release of WWE 2K17, for which Goldberg was the cover star, that started those conversations. As we've seen in recent years, Triple H's booking is far more focused on numbers and record-breaking title reigns than his predecessor. Since he took over WWE Creative in July 2022, Roman 
Roman Reigns has had the longest world title reign in modern history. Bianca Belair broke the record for the longest time as Raw Women's Champion. And Gunther has just passed 650 days as Intercontinental Champion, breaking the record for the longest singular reign and most cumulative days as champion. So I think it's safe to conclude. Yes, Triple H also did all of that to further gaslight Goldberg. Gasberg. Do you think Triple H was purposefully trying to dilute Goldberg's legacy? Let me know in the comments down below because I'll be replying to people from out of the game. It's how you play it. The funny thing is, it's not just Trips who might be trollberging. His fellow click members still do it to this day. When Asuka officially passed Goldberg's undefeated streak, she tweeted about how much she respected Bill. Only for Scott Hall to reply, you're much more talented than Goldberg. And in this week's episode of Click This, Kevin Nash explained the reason he had to end Goldberg's original streak. It's because nobody liked him anymore. I'm like, well, we were all there, and if we go to the Northeast, they were booing Bill, you know? It wasn't like all of a sudden it was like, you know, we have to beat Bill. It was just like, Bill's starting to be the Yankees. Bill's starting to be the Yankees. Nobody wanted the Patriots to beat the Dolphins' f***ing record. Sports. But Nash went on to say it was neither him or Goldberg who killed WCW. It was Jay Leno. But you want to talk about what killed the f***ing WCW? Jay Leno f***ing getting, I think he had DDP in an arm bar. Like, you gonna tell me f***ing Jay Leno's gonna get you in an arm bar? As if Conan O'Brien wasn't enough, you had to kill WCW too, Jay? Ah, if only we had a video on this very channel investigating who really did kill WCW. I mean, Jay Leno doesn't sound right, but I just don't know enough to argue it. Oh yeah, just one more thing. We do have one! Watch Who Really Killed WCW by clicking the link in the video description below. Because, content promotional segue! Our next Wrestle Talk original goes live tomorrow, where I do a deep dive exploring how The Rock went from being one of the most unselfish wrestlers in the Attitude Era, to Hollywood making him a very effective political player, and how he used that to effectively take over WWE this year. Here's a clip. Johnson had successfully negotiated a position on the board of WWE's parent company TKO and loads of shares in it, ownership of the rock intellectual property, and, according to some, the main event of WrestleMania XL. In one fell swoop, The Rock had become head of WWE creative Paul of X's biggest star and his boss. Triple H, once thought to have been pro wrestling's most successful backstage politician, just found himself between a rock and, and well, another rock. That video took me and the team a lot of research. Some of us had to watch Black Adam. So please do subscribe and enable notifications to Always On to know when it goes live first. And comment, give it a thumbs up, and share it around when it does. Triple H, despite his singular mission to annoy Bill Goldberg, does seem to inspire the loyalty and respect of his roster. That's the sign of a booker that's also become a leader. And sometimes that loyalty can be so intense, wrestlers will follow you out the door if you decide to leave. The story of Rossi Ogawa and stardom is fascinating. Kind of overshadowed by Vince McMahon resigning from WWE and Scott Demore leaving TNA, Ogawa was the other longtime head of a major wrestling promotion that decided to go earlier this year. Ogawa founded the Joshi or All Women's Promotion Stardom back in 2010. It helped produce some of the best women's wrestlers in recent times, like Kairi Sane and Io Sky, and this is where others like Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter honed their craft. After 10 years, Agawa sold the promotion to Bushi Road, which is also the parent company of New Japan. The next year, 2020, would then see the first ever women's match take place at a Wrestle Kingdom, albeit in a dark match. But something else also happened in 2020. The pandemic hit, and that severely derailed the growing New Japan and stardom momentum. During the years since, Agawa has been reportedly frustrated with Bushi Road's creative direction for stardom, on which he was still an executive producer. He put in his notice last year, with his last date being February 18th, but the company decided to fire him on February 4th, because of allegations that Rossi was poaching stardom talent 
to launch his own promotion. And those fears have become reality, as Tokyo Sports is reporting four of Stardom's top wrestlers are expected to leave to join Agawa's new company, which Dave Meltzer has also confirmed. I'm gonna get my comeuppance now because I made fun of Bill Goldberg not being able to pronounce Japanese names earlier. Atami Hayashita. Atami Hayashita, the current Stardom Tag Team Champion and winner of the 2021 Women's Wrestling MVP in the Wrestling Observer Awards. Mirai, who has won their Cinderella tournament in both 2022 and 2023. Former artist of Stardom Champion Mei Sakurai. And 19-year-old Yuzuki, who won this year's Rookie of Stardom tournament, are all expected to go and join Agawa's new promotion. Meltzer noted, there's a lot of people who are committed to leave that are staying. So that's interesting. Some of those staying could be because there is still time remaining on their contracts. In addition to those four wrestlers, Stardom's top star, Julia, is also expected to join Agawa's new company before she eventually signs with WWE. Which brings us to how this fits in the larger geopolitical wrestling context. New Japan and AEW had a successful several years long wrestling partnership even if AEW does keep signing New Japan's top stars. But despite that, there seemed to be tension between Tony Khan and Agawa. Back in November, the official Stardom Twitter account complained about AEW never sending any wrestlers to their promotion. And then when Agawa was fired in February, Tony Khan seemed to celebrate that on Twitter, posting, Bye Rossi, and then two gifs referencing undercover agents and industrial espionage. There's speculation that Agawa's new promotion could start a working relationship with WWE. While you await my rock WWE takeover backstage politics in wrestling, movies and beyond video that goes live tomorrow, watch our video essay on who really killed WCW.